both the psychiatrist and the inmates of the mental hospital. And it's a very silent thing, an unconscious thing, which is not brought out into the open because to even bring it out into the open would be a threat to their present daydreams of not being in a, into an asylum. So it's a very secret, silent agreement by which all the inmates, that is, all the people of the world, have agreed to. And to reinforce the delusion that it is not an asylum, a thousand marvelous labels, dramatics, actions, trickeries are also agreed upon. There will be social occasions in which everybody is laughing and, ha and having a good time. There will even be therapy sessions in which people gather to hear a talk by a famous expert on mental health, how to recover your mental health, how to maintain your mental health. And these speakers will have degrees. And all this is part of the agreement among all of them, patients and experts, all a part of the agreement which says, shush now, we're not going to see where we actually are. Because mankind wishes to remain in the asylum because having been born on this level, few of them have ever aspired to investigate the conditions in the mental hospital. This is strictly taboo. You don't actually investigate to see what's going on right inside the asylum itself. For example, if a patient begins to question the, the sanity of the doctor, the doctor will immediately and angrily, by the way, say, see, there is evidence that you belong here in this insane asylum. You belong here because you question my sanity. Don't you understand there's a difference in us? I am sane telling you that there's something wrong with you, but we can work it out and all that. So the game goes on endlessly, everyone pretending, everyone agreeing not to see through the condition that they're in. This, of course, is what perpetuates, perpetuates what keeps going the cruelty, the viciousness, the lies, the heartache, the suffering, the despair within the asylum. Because nobody, nobody in there, from the president of the place on down to the newest inmate, wants to question the conditions that they're in. They don't want to question the therapy sessions to see that they being on the level of madness can only create more madness and more disillusion and make people deeper in the, in the asylum. No one wants to question anything because for one reason, or two reasons, if you question uh, and, uh, that, the, that the, the question the asylum, then you will have to admit that you are not right. Look, it's as simple as that. I will have to admit that I haven't been right all the years that I've been in here, but will have to see that I've been wrong and my vanity, my conceit, doesn't want to concede that at all. And connected with that is the second part. If I begin to question it and bring up in the smallest way to you, I wonder if this this uh, pleasure party that we've called it, this, this uh, nice place that we've called the insane asylum, I wonder if maybe we have simply put a label on it. I'm talking to, to another inmate, you see, and I say, why don't you and I get together and question the condition that we're in. And I'm, a, I'm afraid to do this to begin with, and I won't, probably won't do it. And only the person who begins to do this can ever get out. But he has to be able, listen, he has to be able to take whatever the reaction is of this other person. See, I'm beginning to wonder about my madness and about my confinement here. And because I'm weak and don't know which way to turn, 
I turn to my what I call my best friend in the asylum, and I begin to talk it out with him. I need someone to talk to about this because I, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'd like to get someone else's opinion on it because I'm beginning to suspect something dreadful and it's so scary. I'd like to see maybe if you feel the same way about it and maybe you've been afraid to bring it out to me. So I ask the inmate in the bed next to me one night, we're just sitting around talking, I ask him, do you think that maybe there's something about this whole business that we don't understand? And of course, at first I'm vague because I'm, I'm afraid to be specific. I don't want to say, you know, I, I, I think there's something dreadfully wrong with me. I, I may be mad. I may be insane. I don't want to come out that blunt with it. So I have to feel my way very gently with the other lunatics around me because I sense that they're in the same state I am. And yet I'm desperate for someone to talk to. And already I've advanced to the point where I can't say that to the psychiatrist or to the psychologist or whoever's the, the, the ward man who's ever taken care of my ward. I can't talk to anyone because I be, my very knowledge is beginning knowledge of my own insanity has made me suspect something dreadful that they are indeed as mad as I am. And no matter what I say, they're going to say something that's going to keep them protected, which means they can't do anything to help me. And so whatever you happen to answer to me, I'm going to have to take that rightly. If you say, oh, look, everything is all right. It's just a question of time. We have people here, experts here who've gone to college for 20, college and, and, and uh, experience for 20 years, and they're going to help us to get out. I can't believe that anymore. But, but it's dreadful for me to, uh, just to be in the state I am and trying to find help because I know that I already suspect everybody I talk to about this is going to lie to me, but there's something in me that, that refuses to sit back and be quiet about, quiet about it anymore. I have to begin to investigate, but every time I do, I get more frightened than I w was before. Are you following this so far? Mm -hmm. See what's going on? Now I'll ask you a question. Have I described you? Yeah. Hmm? Have you have you experienced somewhat this state that I'm talking about? Huh? Yes. Right. Who are you going to talk to? There's nobody. Don't you know that there's nobody to talk to? This is why I told you to watch faces. And listen, you watch the face of the experts. You know what the who the experts are. The people who get paid, among other things, or don't get paid, maybe they just enjoy telling you that they can help you. The unprofessionals, who would like to be professionals, but they don't have the degree or something. Who are you going to talk to about it? Boy, I'll tell you, this, this is dreadful. I've got to do something, but everything I do scares me more. There is an answer to it. Thank heaven. And the answer is, you must, listen, so you'll understand it. You must remain in the lunatic asylum. This is very difficult because the words can go either way. If you try to escape the insane asylum before really understanding it, you'll get outside the gates of that one and walk a mile down the street and go into the next one, the next asylum down the street, and you'll say, I have escaped the asylum. Not only that, but you will apply for a position as a psychiatrist in the second <laughs> asylum. And the first thing you'll ask is, what's the salary? And how much sick leave time do I get, which you'll lie about and take advantage of? And what pressure group can I join to get better benefits for psychiatrists? You don't care about the people in there anymore than you care about yourself. Back to the first asylum where we still are. I'm going to have to walk around very quietly 
the grounds and watch everything that goes on in there, very carefully observing, watching the faces of everybody, watching, for, for example, how a man who is ambivalent will be very happy toward me one minute, very comforting, very friendly, and then the next minute he's hostile. All right, I understand that. But what I've got to watch in relation to me is that when that patient in the next bed was very cheerful and happy and generous, he gave me a candy bar and talked about intelligent things. We talked about uh, the garden out there where they're growing some things. And he said, well, I think it needs a little less water. You mustn't overwater those plants because I, I used to grow them. And he sounds very intelligent and very friendly. But I must watch in myself how when he is friendly toward me, I swallow it whole. I don't remember, I don't want to remember that ten minutes later when all of a sudden he goes like that and he turns against me and, and anger and hatred. I don't see that because my, being weak, the shock of him doing that blocks my remembrance that ten minutes earlier <coughs> he was friendly to me and I enjoyed it. If I can remember at once this ambivalent man, this divided man, this contra contradictory man, if I can remember that one minute he was real nice and kindly and gentle and friendly with me, and then another person, another person took over and he was loaded with hostility. There were, there's two people in that man. And I have begun to see for the first time, this is just one man, I got the whole institute to work on. This is just one man who is divided. But most importantly, as I said before, most importantly, I have got to see that when he was friendly, I felt good. When he was hostile, I felt bad. I'm getting close to something. I'm, I'm getting close to seeing a horror that I must see if I'm to become healthy. I felt good when he treated me nicely. I felt bad when he treated me bad. I am two people, right? I am two people, both of them, both of them, depending on and getting a source of identity by the way he behaves toward me. Now I've got another Another thing to see, I'm not living from me at all. I'm living from the exterior pleasures or pains inflicted upon me, I think, in my delusion, by the behavior of that split man out there. I really see that I have no freedom, no independence from the exterior world because I am divided and my division is depending upon his division to give me my false identity. First of all, I am happy when he's happy with me. I am miserable when he's miserable with me. So I've tracked it down so far and believe me, we have miles and miles of tracking to do yet. Not this small this morning. But I have tracked it back to seeing that I am two people. I am dependent upon the exterior world for giving me a sense of identity, a sense of life, a false feeling of life. Now, a certain beginning of the positive forces can enter because my knowledge of the exterior world and my own knowledge of myself and both of them intermingled, how they work together, that knowledge has begun to increase my questioning so that I'll go 
a thousand times deeper into knowledge so that I'm free of exterior judgments and interior judgments too about what the world is really like and what I am really like. This beginning of the knowledge is my first step toward understanding that I'm in the lunatic asylum. Therefore, also the first step toward the gate so that when I get outside the gate finally through all this intense work on myself, when I get outside the gate, I will know that I'm leaving an insane asylum and have also left the insane asylum which is in me too. The, ins the nut house that I'm leaving is my nut house as well as out there, of course, because the other person is as mad as I am. But I have to free myself from my insanity so that when I step outside of the gate, I will stay outside of it and know that I'm a free man instead of walking down a mile down the street to the next insane asylum and then getting an identity of being a free man, which is only a label on myself, you see? So when I'm inside, still in, we're still inside, be there for a long time. When I'm still inside of it, think of what I have asked for myself. Now you get personal with this and you work on what I'm going to say to you now. As long as I'm an inmate, I will be the victim, the slave of the problems, of the delusions, of the, of the madnesses, of the heavinesses of everyone else in there. In other words, I can't be, I will take as real that man's problems in the bed next to me. He comes up to me angry and he tells me about some political situation. He comes up to me fearful and he tells me about some, something that happened to him. And because my, my problems are, quote mark, real to me, I will automatically, unconsciously, unknowingly take his problems as being real too. So when he says, this, this is a world where you're persecuted left and right, he's a paranoid person, he feels persecuted. He comes up to me and says, you know, those people over there are poisoning my soup and they're planning of ways to hurt me. When he says this to me, and his face is deadly serious, and he's in, quote mark again, earnestness, when he says that to me, because I am doing the same thing unconsciously, unknowingly, I feel persecuted too. And I wish that he would stop talking so I could tell him how, how I feel persecuted. But when he comes up to me with a solemn, scared face, I foolishly, unnecessarily, because I'm in the same state, take it on as real, and I get depressed, and I get scared, and I get worried. I have taken, in my sleep, his burden as being real, therefore, have taken it as being my burden, and I suffer too. This is, this is what immorality really is, basically. Two inmates of the asylum, both being sick, have no choice but to pass their burden, trying to unload their burden. That's what they're trying to do. It never works. But we, we all try to do this by telling other people about our problems, about how badly we've been treated, how much we've been persecuted. And you had better pause right now in the middle of this talk to see how vicious you are, how cruel you are by just going around with the facial expression you have and 
perpetuating and increasing the illusion in yourself and in everyone you meet that there is a problem because there is none. You're very immoral. You're very vicious. Shall I go on from the expression on your face is enough. When you walk into this room, when you walk into that office, you walk into wherever you work, and you walk into your home with the people you live with, how could you have the nerve to say that you love anyone when you, the weight of you, the burden of you, you're trying to push it off onto your wife by telling them how badly the boss treated you. And you wives doing the same thing with your husband, crabbing, crabbing about the day you went through. You do this because you're an inmate of the lunatic asylum and you don't know it. You still don't know it in spite of the very clear explanation I've given you. Don't be shocked when you begin to see what I've explained to you this morning. You, you will go into shock. I'm saying don't be shocked, but you will be shocked. What I'm saying is don't be afraid of the shock. When you get the shock, notice the shock and don't be fearful of that and that will begin to break the shock. When you see how many people you have in you, when you see, when you see how you burden other people from the smallest of complaints to the overwhelming blabbermouthery of going home and talking for an hour in your neurosis to someone else about your problems. You're, you're, not, you're, you're doing just one thing. You're trying to avoid the responsibility for the problems that you have because you are irresponsible, spiritually speaking. You just want to attract the problem to yourself because you get a certain false thrill out of it. And then once you have exhausted the false thrill out of it, like fighting with the boss, you're such a, a low-level coward, such an ignorant human being. After having had the thrill of telling the boss off, you want to go home and explain to your wife why it was necessary. For heaven's sake, don't you know, and just to begin with, just to begin with, that she's done the same thing herself all day long and she has her problems too. Why don't you wives, and why don't you husbands, and why don't you parents, and why don't you children, and why don't you friends, just for once in your life, start in just a small, small way start to understand yourself and free yourself of your burdens instead of being so conscienceless is to try to put them on someone else's back. Most people are not going to do this. Are you going to be different from them or are you going to continue in the same way of having no decency at all, no light in you at all, just a little machine that only knows one thing to do, to invite your own problems because you're unconscious. And then when they, you've exhausted the thrill, I said exhausted the thrill of having the problem, want to get rid of it by burdening someone else with it. Your understanding of everything we've talked about this morning could, could be, could be, the first step out of the lunatic asylum and out into the free world. I know that when I say anything about anything, it is going to be subject to your neurotic interpretation. And I found out long, long time ago there's no way to avoid it, so I just go right ahead. Okay, now, to be an inmate of the lunatic lunatic asylum simply means that our thoughts and our feelings are working incorrectly. 
it is possible with right work and right persistence to change the way our thoughts and feelings operate and therefore good news it is possible to escape permanently the lunatic asylum all right we're in open discussion now or questions if you have them keep your questions short and to the point Ten minutes of the first half when you were insulting, uh, insulting us, I found that encouraging. I didn't. Uh, it was interesting. It was, yes, right. It was good news for a while. Yes. Just something more different to look at. Do you know something? I can't really insult you, who you really are. I can insult your false personality. So if you feel bad about being insulted, guess where the message fell on? Right? When you asked last night, what do you value? My immediate mental reply was my hatred. Where did that thought come from? Where did it come from? Where did the thought... Right. Is that... Is it the barriers are down at that point and I'm able to see that I do value my hatred or is it ego that jumps? No, no. If you are seeing clearly that you value your hatred, seeing it impartially aside from the hatred itself, that is not a part of your hatred. So you, let's, let's see. Let's get a right word for it. Let's say clear thought is seeing it. Don't go any deeper than that. Some of you are, some of you are going way, way down deep into self-tormenting analysis I'm going to let me bring this up because I've seen it happen several times lately and down in LA too don't analyze to death you understand one clear thought then go understand the next clear thought don't you try to understand things you're not capable of understanding and you'll have to take that generally because we do have to throw ourselves into deeper water in order to learn to swim better or as I usually say it, please saturate yourself with ABC because only the understanding of ABC can lead you on to understanding the next letters of the alphabet. You can't go from ABC to XYZ. If you do that, then the XYZ, which you quote understand, will be imaginary understanding and you will be an inmate of the insane asylum not knowing it. You'll call yourself out of it. In fact, out of it so completely that you're able to help other people. I'll tell you what, this is a very common illustration, but the commoner the better. See those bricks in Leland's wall there? See those bricks? You talk to those bricks sometime for a couple hours about these truths and they will give you as much response as the average person will give you. Those bricks can't hear. Neither can the masses of human beings. Even when a person gets the shock of uh, any... Uh, some of you tell me some shocks you've had. You work a little bit. What, what kind of a shock have you had in your life? Raise your hand and tell us. You know, nothing personal you don't want to talk about. Come on. Uh, life wasn't worth living. Okay, that's good. But that's general, but that's okay. Uh, I thought I knew what I was doing. Thought what? I thought I knew what I was doing. Okay, and you had the shock of seeing you didn't. Joan? The shock you talked about, of seeing that I couldn't talk to people because they had absolutely no comprehension of what I was talking about, about the inner life. Okay, Dorothy, you had Seeing my own pettiness. See your pettiness. Who? Uh, yes, back there, Tom. The greatest and, un and unending one is still that, that I am not all the images I project. Not the images you project. Good. Who else? Dottie or somebody? Uh, no, who is it? When the boss gets mad at me, it's because I actually did something wrong, not because yes. he's insane or anything. That was a great shot. All right. I don't live my life. You don't live your own life. Uh-huh. Jim. Having faith in, quote, good people and being disappointed. Yes. 
All right, now when you have these shocks, whatever they may be, what are you going to do with the shock? I'm asking you a question now. You have all these shocks. From this higher viewpoint, what are you going to do with them when you get them? Because you can even use them, you can use them to break the shock pattern, or you can use them to increase the shock pattern, which will always be unconscious. You won't know you're increasing it. Let's, well, all right. We'll see what the average person does when they have a shock. It drives them deeper into their sleep because they love the false pleasure of it. The false pleasure of being the, the center of your own dramatization when something happens to you. Then you go on and complain that you're persecuted or whatever, as we discussed earlier. Everything depends on what you're doing with the shocks that you all that are already churning inside of you but you have not brought them up to consciousness yet so you don't even know how bad off you are our purpose here is to begin to begin to see the state of shock we're all all the time living in as evidenced by a thousand things one of them being touchiness how many of you are real touchy you know what i mean by that you get touched where you're hiding something, right? Don't you know that that is a slumbering shock? And we're trying to bring it up to see, for example, why we get shocked. I get shocked only because I'm in contradiction, wanting to present to the world and to me a certain idea of about what kind of a person I am. And if you touch me so that I begin to suspect that I'm a liar, I'm going to get angry at you because that, listen, it's so complicated. The pleasure I get from being, from calling myself, myself a good person, that pleasure feels threatened when you tell me I'm a hypocrite. All right. Feeling the loss of the pleasure of picturing myself as a good person, I am afraid of death the death of the pseudo good person therefore to prevent the death of that or rather to replace the threatened death of that I immediately <clears throat> go into being another person who hates you for threatening me what I call the truth about myself but now I am quote mark saved I'm saved you have destroyed my picture of being a good person but thank god i have an alternative i am now someone who hates you for exposing me thank god i preserved myself i don't have to die i'm alive as a hateful person are you understanding mm -hmm. the next time this happens to you have the courage to die to both the being the good person and the hypocritical person, the bad person, the hateful person, die to everything so that no new eye of any kind is formed, which is death, which is life. And you're on. That's something to think about, huh? For a long time. Uh, the greatest shocks were in class with Vernon Howard. It's very shocking. Yes, because I'm presenting the truth to him. And then soothing afterwards. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can't explain it. Yes, it, it, look, it goes from shock then to right soothing you're not getting any false soothing in here and you know it from shock to right soothing which is the comfort of god himself which is the comfort of sensing the truth after the shock because you've begun to began begun to understand what the shock is all about you understand you get the shock because we're have a project a picture of being this or that kind of person we get the shock when life or someone contradicts that then I explain 
that you will simply die, give up all mental processes, and you begin to suspect this is a way out. This is not just comfort. This is a glory hallelujah. But get, take it soothing first before you get the glory hallelujah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, last night I felt like, I, I think I felt the glory, or like the glory hallelujah. I felt that, and I wonder if it's false. You know, I, I question that it's real or not. I, I don't know. It is never wrong to question the truth, God will never judge you for questioning. You understand? It wants you to question. Because if you question, then you can begin to distinguish between falsehood posing as truth and truth itself. Truth can stand the scrutiny of the ages a billion, trillion, trillion times. So don't ever be afraid to question with the false fear that God will think I'm doubting him. You had better begin to question what's going on in your mind so you can get to God. Otherwise, you'll be worshiping the devil, your own mind, your own thoughts, thinking that it's God. And your life will show it. And your face will show it. And your words will show it. Right? Yes. Tom. Uh, some some members, some especially male members of this class, have challenged you, saying to you, uh, "Vernon, please shock me, jolt me. I can take it." And the thing is that, that if their conscience was fully exposed, they could not take it. The very fact that um, uh, say that say that last part again. If their conscience was 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 exposed, their essence was exposed momentarily to to receive a full impact of a jolt, they could. They could not take no, no, I'll tell you. You have to take this one small jolt at a time. Otherwise, you'll go into imagination. All right, Mr. DeFrancis. We, uh, we must consciously be aware when we ask a question that the question is not loaded with hostility, pretending to be the real thing. Oh, yes. Have you seen it in this class, someone asking an apparently sincere question in a hostile mood, hostile face? You've seen it here many, many times. And there's another much more tricky way than that. A hostile person can be very obvious if you're observant at all. But watch out, watch out for the intelligent person who is smart enough not to be hostile, because a part of him is saying they're going to see through you. So you you put on a different kind of a role, which will be much much more cunning. Don't don't get angry or anything, but be very calm and very self possessed. And you ask a certain question that sounds intelligent. I will tell you that that is also loaded with hostility, and I can spot it at a glance. And I've heard it to one degree or another several times this morning. Boy, you don't know what you're in for. I'm going to tell you something. Every one of you in this room, every single one of you, and I know you watch how you take this now. If you leave this class, if you leave these teachings, these tapes, these books that you're reading, because they're all one, one thing working together in different ways. If you leave this, if you don't come back to these classes, you're going to remain in the insane asylum thinking that you're out or either or at least getting out. How's that for strong stuff, especially you new people back there? You watch how you take what I just... I know this, because I know how rare, very, very rare, truth, real truth classes are. And I know that you will go down to some church class or some psychology group or some little group here or there, study class here or there, and you, because you're still a part of the nut house, pretending that you're not, you will not see any difference whatever in this class and that one you here down at that church in California or New Mexico or wherever. 
you won't see any difference in the two. If you don't see a difference in this class and every single, every other class or group or church, psychology, whatever, if you don't see a difference in this teachings in this room and in every other room you've been in, you are in the lunatic asylum not knowing that you are. How's that for strong stuff? It's so strong you didn't hear me. I know that. How many of you resent life? Make it a little stronger. How many of you hate life? You, Dorothy? But you don't know what to do about it. You're trapped, aren't you? You've got to live it. <laughs> and you don't like it. Ah, I see. Ah. Someone gave you a lemon. <laughs> Just think, <laughs> we got a room full of lemons <laughs> and no sugar to go with it. Yes, Jim. Well, you know, uh, Rod and I were talking earlier, we were looking around the room and said, this, this is the cream of the crop. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best, huh? <laughs> This is very elementary advice, but what on earth good does it do you to resent life? Yeah, I'll tell you, it, it does you uh, it does a lot of good to your false personality, to the part of you that demands its own way. But we won't go into. It. Is Fred here? Oh, Fred's here. Right. Okay. Or, oh, we're on. All right. All right. An illustration. And you'll see the connection. Picture a baseball stadium, and ladies, you don't have to know anything about baseball to understand this. Picture a baseball stadium and two groups of men, nine each on a team, are being instructed on how to play baseball by, a, by an umpire who knows all the rules, who knows how baseball is played expertly. So he calls them down and begins to explain the game. And he calls one man up and he says, now you understand that when you stand up at the plate here, you're given three swings at the ball. That's called three strikes. If you miss the ball, why well, you're out and you have to retire until your next turn up the bat. So you understand that one of the first rules in playing baseball is you should get three swings at the ball. Or if the pitcher pitches one that's in good position where you could have hit it and you don't, then, of course, I'll call a strike. So that's a strike on you. Three strikes, you're out. So the man says, uh, well, look, um, I don't like that that way. I want four strikes. <laughs> and the referee, being a human being and being intimidated and being smaller and weaker, and whose salary depends upon baseball being played, he sputters a little bit and he looks around and see how the others are taking. He says, well, all right. And reluctantly he says, okay, you can have four strikes instead of the rules of the game of three. So the next man comes up and the umpire explains, now I'm gonna explain home runs to you. You see, if you give that ball a whack, you hear the crack of it and it goes over the fence, that's called a home run. And all you have to do is, after knocking over the fence, is run around all four of the bases, first, second, third, and come into home. And that's called a home run. <laughs> Raise your hands, the guilty sinners. <laughs> We'll explain later. <laughs> Back to the baseball game. When Sally comes down. So the umpire says, if you whack it over the fence, you run around four bases, that's a home run. And the player kicks his feet around the dirt a little bit, and he chews his tobacco a little bit. He says, look, uh, 
I would prefer, if you uh, don't mind, or even if you do mind for that matter, that uh, it's called a home run if I just hit it on the ground a little bit out past third base there. That's what I would like to be called a home run. Okay. And the uh, umpire thinks, um, well, this man helps pay my salary and he's influential in the league. Okay. In your case, we'll make an exception. You just bump the ball. We'll call that a home run. And so it goes on and on, every player coming up and wanting to impose his own rules onto the baseball game. Every individual wants the game to conform to what he personally wants. All right, not only that, but the opposing team who's watching all this is going, going on, hey, where's our turn at the bat? So they go down and the first one collars the referee and says, look, You've given them all kind of advantages. How about giving them a few disadvantages that would be advantages to us? For example, we want you to change it so instead of running 50 yards to first place, base, they have to run two blocks. And on and on and on. And the referee, again, being weak and intimidated and having no mind of his own, being a slave to himself and therefore to all the baseball players. So, well, okay. We'll make them run two blocks. That'll even things up. After all, they get a home run and just bunting the ball. Do you understand what we're getting at a little bit here? Every individual wants to play the game in his own little way. Go right down the line, every one of us in this room, trying to impose our rules on life. Can you imagine what kind of a baseball game it would be if everyone violated the rules and had them according to his own personal desires? There'd be no game. It would be madness. It would be insanity. And that's exactly what we have in the world today. All of us thinking, get this now, this is the, the heart of it. All of us in our delusion, in our angers, in our suppressions, thinking, really thinking, that there is a game to win. That's why, ah, now we're getting a little more understanding of the situation. We all think that there is a game for me, for Leland, for Chuck, for Dorothy, to win personally. And so we try to impose our rules on all of life, both as human beings who are individuals and as human beings who have got together to join an organization, whether it's a baseball league or a political organization, whatever, in order to have more power to enforce, to impose our neurosis on the rest of life, other people, on events, because we think that there's a game to win, and if we can get all this extra power by organization, after all, as much there's much more intimidation in ten idiots screaming for what they want than one person standing alone. And I've gone into this many, many times before regarding organizations, so I'm not going to go into it now except to say all organizations without exception are pressure groups made up of individuals who, first of all, join the organization for their own personal benefits not because they care for society or care for anyone else. They don't even care for themselves because you're destroying yourself when you try to impose your acquired rules onto life. It won't work. It never will. And wouldn't you agree that the game is no fun, played the way it is? Not many people are willing to just slow down and take a look and see how they are demanding that their particular rules of pleasure, of financial profit, of what is called worldly success, that these rules are the very rules that are making their life no fun at all. You know very well. You think about your day today, and I'll guarantee you that you didn't have much fun. Whether you were aware of it or not, you may have been living in a nice, enormous distraction today. You may have had something exciting or interesting happen, happen to you that you forgot the primary rule, one primary rule of this class, which is to all day long watch and see what's going on inside of you, not with any judgment at all, but simply to become aware 
of how scared you are over that small incident or over that memory that you remember that came up into your thought about something that happened simply see the state we're in and if we were to abandon this is the important part now if we were to abandon all the rules that we try to impose upon the game of life abandon all rules don't insist on any at all if we could begin to see that we would begin to see that it's not necessary thank God it's not necessary to engage in the game at all therefore equally unnecessary to try to threaten the umpire to try to band together in a hate group calling themselves loving it's not necessary to do anything against anyone else because we now see that anything we get at the benefit expense I should say at the expense of someone else I gain to my own punishment I can't I can't do anything at all against you without also doing it against myself how many do understand this rule how many don't understand it? don't you understand that your state your negative state your sour state your impatient state this is what you're living how can you be look take a common word how can you be a happy carefree human being when you are very annoyed and impatient over that long line down at the grocery market or over that letter that doesn't come or over that person who promises you something and doesn't fulfill that promise how can you call yourself a happy person well the problem is you don't really listen to me listen to me you don't care whether you're happy or not you don't care about that what you do care about is that you have enough thrills and shakings going on inside of you including your anger that will prevent you from seeing what happiness really is because the last thing you want to see is what it means to sit back or stand up and go through life without having any concern at all as what happens to you you don't want to see this because you're quite convinced in your delusion that the game is real look look I've got the baseball uniform on I'm out there swinging at the ball what difference does it make if half the time I'm swinging at the ball and half the other half the time swinging at the uh, head of the opposite team it doesn't make much difference what I'm doing in my delusion as long as I'm I've keep kept myself deceived into thinking that what I'm doing is important exciting and that it will finally lead me to look up at the scoreboard and see that my team won therefore I won my pressure organization won the uh, pressured the Congress so they got the bill through it we pressured this or that we marched like idiots around the building demanding that they do this or don't do that to the building whatever I would tell you this is your life you sitting in front of me right now and you listening to this tape this is the way you are living what do you suppose what do you suppose is going to give you the jolt that you're going to see that each one of you here without exception are trying to play your own little game trying to make yourself and other people think that it's look you don't know you're playing the game you don't know it I give you this illustration in this talk to make you aware that you're engaging in it you might be very well bred in society you may not go out and deliberately say rude things to people you may not steal their money I'm not talking about that because the 
those sort of things start internally. I'm talking about you doing something against yourself, therefore breaking the spiritual rules, the cosmic rules, doing something against yourself, but you don't see it because you're quite convinced that this game playing will eventually lead you to victory. What are you talking about? What do you want? Look, you're playing the game and you do all these dirty tactics, all this cruelty, all this falseness in order to win the game. Now I'm going to ask you, when the game is over and you have won, what have you won? You don't know. And you never will. Oh, I'll change that. You know what you'll have won, only it changes every two hours. Right? You wanted that woman. Now that you've got her, what are you going to do with her? You wanted that man. Now that you're well acquainted with him, don't you wish you hadn't become acquainted with him? You wanted all that money. You've got it. And after bragging about it to everybody, how much money you've made, now what are you going to do with it? You're going on that nice, beautiful cruise into the Mediterranean, and you tell everybody about that. A two-week cruise. So you go on it, and now you're back home again. Where are you? Internally, you're right where you were when you went down to the port and got on to the cruise. Ask yourself what you're trying to do with your life, what you're trying to win. If you'll see that there's nothing to win, that will get you out of the ballpark altogether so that you can't hurt either yourself or those other people. And it's always back and forth, clubbing each other, wanting to win. Oh, I'll tell you right now, probably I believe this is the third time I've said this, get to the point where you see there's nothing for you to win. When you do that, that is the winning. Then you know what you do. You get up in the morning, you go to your office, you get up in the morning, you take care of the children. You get up in the morning, you go through your day not afraid of your husband, not afraid of the boss, not afraid of being fired, not afraid of the future, not afraid of being criticized. And one reason you're not afraid of being criticized is because you have learned through taking criticism in the right way by not letting it fall on your vanity, by taking criticism and shocks and hurts and problems, by taking them in the right way, that has been one of the contributions in which you see there's no game to engage in. You'll walk very sadly out of that ballpark when you begin to understand this, and you'll walk one slow step at a time, looking back over your shoulder, looking, you, you look back at all those people who are having all that fun, each demanding their own rules, causing an uproar, fighting with each other, screaming in triumph when the score is nine to eight, and then getting dejected when it's ten to nine against you. We're trying to walk out of the ballpark here tonight and then the other meetings. Slowly walk out, daring to walk out because you're going to miss the crowd, you know. Look, the spectators to that insane baseball game are just as insane as the players. They're all in the same lunatic asylum, calling it a ballpark. It's all one big lunatic asylum. So you're going to miss the applause from your friends, and you're going to miss the flattery that your wife or girlfriend or boyfriend used to give you. The flattery, the f which, see, you don't even know what flattery is. And I'll tell you, what, um, among other things, it's not just saying you have a pretty new hat. Flattery is just when someone comes over and wants to be in your company, and we swallow it whole, well, I certainly must be worthy, he keeps coming over or she keeps coming over, I must be at least minimally acceptable to him or her. Everything falls on our vanity, doesn't, doesn't it? We twist it 
to make ourselves seem important. And why do we do that? Because we sense that it's all false. That we let me change it a little bit. I'll ask you a question. Why do you have to be approved by anyone? Why do you have to feel important? Now let's go a little a little farther. Why do you want to be loved by anyone? Don't you know when you say, I hope that man loves me or that woman loves me, or even I hope God loves me, are you lovable just to begin with? But that isn't the point. The point is, who is the person who is being loved by another person? But we've gone into this. Maybe this is new to some of those of you who have come here just recently. Who is the person being loved? Who is the person who needs to be reassured every five minutes? And so you sell your soul to that stupid man or that hard-faced woman. I don't know who's the dumbest, men or women. I think it's an even tie in their relations with the opposite sex. If you want to enjoy the battle fighting with the other players and with your own teammates, by the way, because you not only want to win the game, but you want to be the hero of the game that knocks the home run over the fence, that breaks the tie, so you're carried on the shoulders out of the stadium and given first place on television. I'll ask you again, then I'm going to stop. What do you want to win? What are you putting all this energy in, into? I'll tell you where. You're putting it into certain a certain set of dreams that you have built up, that you have permitted to take you over. A certain set of dreams that say, if, if this happens, or that happens, then this awful ache, this awful heartache, which you all have, this awful heartache will go away. But sometimes on the law of accident, they do happen. You do get the money, you do get the friend, or you do get rid of something that's been bothering you, and you get the thrill of it, and then the thrill wears off, as it always does. And now you have to start all over looking for salvation, looking for salvation. Let me tell you something. Don't you forget this. Essentially, there is no salvation because there is no one needing salvation. We've done it. We've seen it. Oh, have you? <clears throat> You're trying to save an illusion. You're trying to save an invented personality. You can't. You'll drive yourself nuts. You'll keep your heartache. You'll keep your false hopes if you try to save yourself. You can't. There's no one there to be saved. Seeing that is salvation, but way, 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 way up here. Not on the level of words, of description, of the intellect. This means, this means if you no longer think about yourself as someone who needs to win the game, who needs to get this promise fulfilled, who needs this hope answered, who needs this prayer answered, if you see that the person who prays is a false person trying to perpetuate himself in the name of religion, if you see that, doesn't this hope this false prayer, 
this desire, this wish, this yearning collapse. If you collapse, the false yearning collapses. If the false yearning collapses, you collapse. And that is salvation without talking about it. You want to spend the rest of your life talking about getting out of traps, getting out of the jungle, saving yourself. You want to spend the rest of your life talking about it and reading books and coming to classes. Then you just stay on the level of the ordinary mind of the intellect and talk about it, and you'll never make it. You'll talk about it. And you'll join sooner or later if this is what you want. And those of you listening to this tape remember this this is what you want, you will be forced to join an organization, whether you call it one or not. You'll be forced to band with other people because they become your fault salvation. All of you running around lying to each other that you've found God, that you're going to heaven when you die. And if there were a trillion, trillion, trillion words, religious words in the world, all of them put together wouldn't be enough to convince you that you're making sense and that what you're saying is true. Sooner or later, the mind and the entire psychic system has to slow down and has to come to an end of itself. It must come to an end to talking about God, about salvation, about escape from the prison. It must, listen, listen, it must slow down completely and become so still that the word salvation, the word me, the word escape, the word happiness, the word peace, the word heaven, the words can't express themselves anymore because the mind isn't operating on that level to save them. which is the only salvation there is and the only one you'll ever, ever find. Don't waste your life anymore fighting needlessly. We're here to see what we're doing falsely, what we're doing wrongly. Please concentrate on seeing where you're going right, not what you're doing right, because you're not. Try to see where you want your own way. Try to see where you have self-will. Try to see where you refuse to look at yourself. Try to see where you still get comfort from people who are as big a liar as you are. Try to see where you want petty advantages over other people. Try to see where you excuse yourself for not going harder into this. At first, you may be, only, be able to see only one little small thing work and next time you'll see three things then six things then ten things and the work will go real fast and let me tell you what right work consists of and then I'll stop right work consists of putting an end to the delusion that you need to go anywhere at all and to attain anything at all only the false self invented personality thinks that it needs to add anything to itself. God, who is complete, cosmic consciousness, who has everything, your real nature, which is whole and permanent, eternal, doesn't need a thing. Find out these truths for yourself. Then you'll feel them. Then you'll know them. Then you'll live them. I want to ask uh, the same question of a number of volunteers. And when I ask you, please answer short, clear sentences. Don't give a speech. And the first volunteer will be Dorothy. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy, what do you think is the purpose of this class? Say that again. To see that we don't exist as in the way we always thought we did. All right. Mr. DeFrancis, what do you think is the purpose of this class? 
purpose of this class loud and clear please the purpose of this class is to get a conscious awareness of ourselves which we just don't have but we believe we do I like that last part best that we believe we do <laughs> Connie you have volunteered what do you think is the purpose of this class the purpose of this class is to help us to see what maniacs we are help us to see what maniacs we are that was right to the point wasn't it Juan what is the purpose of this class the purpose of this class is to wake up to see ourselves as we actually are this is a, a conscious awareness of cosmic fact this or not life aims at all this is something much higher it has nothing to do with life aims or goals at all all right now real honestly sally why did you smile well i smiled because one you said for us to be it in a clear sentence short sentences and one in my mind was rambling on yes jean what is the purpose of this class to detect the difference between my inner self and the outer world. Say that again. To see the difference between my inner self and the outer world so the outer world doesn't consume me. Oh, ah, that's, that completes it. Yes, Alan? You know what we're supposed to be and we don't. You're trying to show us what we're supposed to be. What we can be, yes, Chuck. Well, I came here by accident, and but I'm fine. The purpose is to get a clear mind. What is the? I'm going to start all over. Chuck, what is the purpose of this class to you? Wake up. Ah, enough said. Ruth. To, to transcend the level. Say that again, please. If you probably make eye contact, you're it. <laughs> Pat. To see what I to see what I am not, so that I will know what I am. Now, wasn't that good? To see what I am not, to know what I am. Randy. Change is possible but it is not anything at all what I thought it would be. The way to do it is not the way I thought it would be. Yes, yes. Jim. To uh, destroy the ego and the false self. Yes, Rod. Purpose is to be able to do something with what I notice in myself. Okay. Dottie. The purpose of this class is to find a way out for myself. How many of you were thinking of a sentence in case you got called on? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. I went further and wrote it down. That's true honesty. All right, we're in open discussion. We have lots of nice time. Comments or questions? What would you like to talk about? Is any type of, is there any type of healthy competition? Healthy competition? Yeah. Give me an example. I don't know, an athletic event. Why do you want to win the ball game? Um, because that's the purpose of the contest. Ah, yes, indeed. If you win the ball game, if the score is uh, 10 to nothing in favor of your team, you get a certain thrill out of it, right? Yes. Hmm? Don't you know, don't you know that if you are on the losing team, you get an equal, th uh, equal thrill? If you've got the zero and the other team has the ten, don't you know that you've got the very same kind of a thrill basically expressing itself? There, we lost. I lost. I'm glad at least I lost. What if I was nobody? I couldn't lose or win. Thank heaven I can lose as well as win. 
I get a variety of neurotic impressions that way. Does that answer your question? Bernard, I'd like to ask a two-part question. One is, can a young child be brought into this work in a constructive way? A child, no. A child has to be given very, very elementary lessons. And guess who's a small child? <laughs> Can we all admit it? Yeah. How many of you big, strong, confident men cry inside? Yeah. How many of you confident ladies cry outside and inside? <laughs> Children have to be given elementary lessons. Yes? What steps can we take? Obviously, we must take the steps toward our own understanding. We do not wish to pass on the garbage we have collected to our own children. Our best way of serving that purpose is to gain greater understanding of this knowledge and greater consciousness is not that's the only way. You give to your children what you are. We've had that before. We've covered that. All right. Honestly, what are you? A confused human being or an enlightened human being? A suppressed, furious human being? Don't you know that that is what you give to yourself and therefore to everyone? And if you don't think so, you may not go out and bop the checkout girl, but you may bop your wife verbally at least, when there's an opportunity for our sickness to explode, and if there isn't one, it isn't an opportunity, we'll make one, won't we? What I'm saying, the state is there. How many of you are suppressed little neurotics? I want to see the hands. <laughs> How are you going to get rid of all this suppressed rage of yours? Quit playing the game. Now, what does that mean? Let's see, what is he talking about? You love the game. You won't give it up. You love the ballpark. With that big audience out there, and if there isn't one out there, it at least exists in your imagination. How many of you want to be heroes? You men want to be big military heroes? How many of you admire General Patton? Huh? MacArthur? You're afraid to slow down, you know. You want to demand four strikes. You want a home run to be a, a bunt. And you love the argument that you get from the umpire and everyone else out there. Do you know? I'm going to tell you something you don't know. Well, that'll take all night. You, you, I'll wait for it if you want to react. You love being rejected. I'm telling you. Now, don't you ever forget what I just said. I know this, and you don't know it. You are in love with being rejected, refused, turned down, humiliated, cast out. You love it. You very carefully calculate situations in which you will be rejected. You know how other people are going to behave in certain circumstances and you deliberately do it because you are living from false feelings of life and one of them is the pleasure of being hated. Because then you can bawl. Then you can sue someone. Then you can hate someone. Then you can go around feeling sorry for yourself then you can be the center of the lunatic asylum. <laughs> you don't know what I've just said. You don't know it because you are it. We're trying to develop something, a point of observation to begin with in this class so that you can see from your own fundamental intelligence the truth of what I just said. You spend, you spend hours every week planning ways to give yourself a stimulation, to get a stimulation. 
And if it doesn't work when you're all alone, if it doesn't work in your own mind, like weakly permitting uh, mortifying thoughts to go through your mind, if that doesn't work, then you'll stir something up out there. And you'll have very bad manners about it, too, because the two go together. You don't even know what bad manners are. It's bad manners to be neurotic. How, how cruel you are, how vicious you are, how unkind you are to pass on your lying nature to everyone who falls for it, which is practically everyone. And there's a part of you that despises everyone who falls for your stage performance. You despise them at the same time you need them. How about that for an inner contradiction that tears you apart? You can save yourself a lot of trouble by merely listening and applying. A lot of future trouble. I don't care what your age is. But you'll never do it until you begin to see through the falseness of pain itself. The f until you begin to see the wrongness of allying yourself with a heavy spirit because it's familiar and gives you something to do with your life. What will I do today? Let's see. I haven't been depressed for a week, so I'll take that. That's right. That's the way it goes. You, you think I'm kidding? That's the way it goes. I haven't been depressed. I've been angry. I've been jealous. I've been petty, but I haven't been depressed, so it's depression's turn. Now let me see what I can be depressed about. Oh, well, I'll make a general rule. My life is just just not what I, I want it to be. I'll tell you why your life isn't what you want it to be, because God, who is way, way above the ballpark, isn't the umpire. He is not listening and compromising like that human umpire does. You can't play by your rules in the cosmic ballpark. And I'll tell you, you're just going to wear yourself out. You're going to drain yourself, and you're going to get older, and you're going to get scareder, and you're going to get tireder, and you're going to get more horrified as you grow older. You're going to do this unless you listen to what you're being told. If you choose simply to continue to wear yourself out by demanding your rules, then that's your choice. But we are here in this group to try to tell you something, and I'll summarize it. You don't know it as yet. None of you knows it as yet. But I am telling you, as the teacher of this class, that whether you know it or not, and you don't know it, there are cosmic rules, there are spiritual principles in which you don't have to win because you've transcended the notion that there's someone there, some entity, Mr. DeFrancis, Mr. Stevenson, who has to win something. I am telling you that all your pain, all your suffering, all your competition, all your anxiety over anything at all, past, present, or future, all your anxiety is false. All of it is false. You don't see it as false because you're still on the level where you love the falseness. It is your best friend. The poison you're giving yourself every day is your best friend. Why? Because you call it milk. You do. My poison is keeping me alive. I'll tell you, the sooner you collapse in a faint at what you don't see, at what you're doing to yourself, the better. How on earth can you call your suppressed rage 
milk. It's poison. You say it's you look, you've got it, you hang on to it, you won't let it go. Why? You're calling it healthy milk that will keep me intact and keep me healthy. Keep you healthy, you're not healthy, you're very sick. 